you got to have trust trust in me and and my abilities to know that I can um, do some special things on the court, not just for myself, but for my guys on, alongside me. And the role that I was taking there was keeping me very limited, you know. And I knew that I could do more. And it was and it was showing in the stats that when the moment, the minutes that I would play, whether it be big minutes or small, I was very efficient and effective. So. Again, I was willing to take that chance and bet on myself to go to a smaller school for a bigger role, for a bigger purpose. Chef, thank you for coming out, um, doing the interview with us. Um, thank you everybody for coming over again and you know watching us having a conversation about your life. So to start off, how are you doing? First off, um, I would like to truly thank everybody that took the time out to come and want to get to know me. Um, I know it's a ton of other things you guys could be doing, spending time with your family, work or whatever. So thank you guys for um, coming out to listen to me talk. I feel that I'm not the most interesting person, maybe. Maybe you guys can be the judge of that. But um, first off, thank you guys, first off. Um, and I'm good, man. My family is back there. Um, they're comfortable. They're happy here. Personally, um, as a family, we're all good. So it's kind of hard for me to complain, really. Um, I have no complaints. So I'm all good, happy. Let's start off with your childhood, basically. Um, uh, is there anything you want to talk about, you know, how you got into basketball, you know, having siblings, growing up in the States, anything you want to share with us? Yeah, so first off, um, I'm born and raised out of Gaston, Alabama, for you guys that don't know. It's a very small town um, in comparison to other bigger cities in the state of Alabama. So where I'm from, um, and this is based off of 2021, um, the population amount was about 33,000 people there in the state of, in the, I mean, not, I'm sorry, in the city of Gaston, which is where I'm from. In comparison to Birmingham and Huntsville, Birmingham has a population of about 190,000. Huntsville has about 270,000, so it's sort of similar to Chemnitz. So I feel that that's a very big uh, part of my life right there. That says a lot of Jeff Garrett and where, what he's about because I come from a very small place. Um, so it's very hard to succeed when you come, around, come up in environments and around people that's that doesn't have the most experience or, that, or hasn't had the pleasure to be around people that's um, made it to high levels or made it to places that they dream, that they would probably dream about or whatever. So, um, so I come from that. I come from a very small town, as I said, um, a pretty big family. I have um, three other siblings, um, older brother, um, youngest brother is 26 now, just turned 26, I have a, and two younger sisters. And, um, I was still like obviously not the oldest, but the second oldest. So I had big responsibilities to take on as a young as a young man. Basically, had to lead when, and I had had the pleasure of having both parents in the household, but still having to lead and be that big brother and be that extended parent at times. Even though I failed on numerous occasions of being a leader at that young of an age, but that's pretty much what I am, where I come from. Basically, long story short. So how was your you know, parents, your home, because to most of the people I actually speak um, that are from the States, and the sample size might not be the biggest, but usually um, they had a pretty rocky you know, childhood. You know, one parent left or they never knew them and, you know, all this negative stuff. How was this in a small town in Alabama? Uh, for me, it was uh, it was very rocky as well. Um, some I don't want to go too deep in because it may be a bit too personal as far as for my parents anyway. But it was a very rocky situation. Uh, I had the pleasure, as I said earlier, to have both parents in the household. Um, even though we still had our trials and tribulations, um, we was able to stay um, all together as a family and not live in in harsher conditions or worse environments than some of what my um, relatives was living in. So we had it off a little better than some of my um, extended family, basically. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was very rocky, as I said. It was um, days that we wasn't sure we would be able to get past, but so, you know, somehow we was able to overcome that or whatever. And um, all of that helped 
um, help all of us become the, the men and women that we are today, basically going through those different trials and tribulations that we had to deal with individually and collectively as a family, basically. Let's transition to basketball. Your dad was um, a basketball player. He also you know, had some achievements in, in, in basketball. Um, how did you, or is, is this like natural for you that your dad you know, put the ball in your hand and was like, son, you gotta play basketball? Or how do you really? Oh, I wouldn't say it was more so of a natural thing. It was just, uh, um, you know, where probably most parents would do, you know, if depending on their profession, if, it, if their dad is a construction worker, he probably, you know, have them out working on this and this to, you know, help them um, gain a feel of what it is they may like to do whenever they're older. So my dad um, kind of put the ball in my hand because he played basketball once before, basically played all sports. So um, pretty much whatever sport he would um, help, um, help push us to become better players at that young age or if we would even like the sport, then he was all for it basically. Um, so once he put the ball in my hands, I just went from there basically, went to Boys and Girls Club. I grew up in a Boys and Girls Club. And for you, those of you who don't know, it's basically a youth organization for basically from kindergarten um, up to eighth grade basically. Once you hit eighth grade, you're basically kind of too old. And um, I grew up there, so I played a lot of basketball, football. We played like hockey on the gym floor. We played uh, recreational games and all of that. So that's where I started coming up, uh, coming up, I'm sorry, coming up playing basketball at that young of an age. So from being in the Boys and Girls Club to, to high school, which is in the States, maybe your first little more professional way of playing basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's more organized than a Boys and Girls Club. So how was your freshman year in high school? How did you, you know, grow into that role? How did you do there? Uh, freshman year of high school was was a different animal because you at that point I was about 15, 16 years old. So you becoming a, a new person, you kind of transitioning into being a man or a woman, basically. And so I had to go through the growing pains of literally, literally growing pains of soreness in the knees every day. Um, you know, clothes not fitting the way they were used to, feet is getting much bigger. Um, um, attention span and getting shorter or whatever. But freshman year was, was very intense for me because it was a very big transition. I go from middle school to where it's about, um, I would say 100 plus people in the, in the whole grade. And then I get to the high school where they have three high schools combined in my city. And it's me and 400 other people, 500 other people in the same freshman class, basically. In one grade. Yeah, so it was a big transition. And I'm a very laid back and shy guy. So it took time for me to open up to, um, because most of the people I went to middle school with was people I went to elementary with for the most part. So I was very familiar with a uh, uh, small percent, well, most of those people. But once we got to the other, once we got to high school and it's basically, two other high schools combined with this high school that I, that I was a part of, middle school that I was a part of. And then it started to be a bit tricky, you know, because again, I had to open up just as much to other people and um, just try to adapt basically. So freshman year, again, was very intense, but it was very rocky at times, but it was also fulfilling for me because I was still transitioning and getting better as a player um, on the basketball court. And um, that was the only sport I was playing at the time. So were you a good player? In high school already? Yeah, I was a really good player, actually. I had the pleasure of um, basically playing varsity. So varsity is the higher level of high schools, like your junior and senior year, basically. Or if you're that good of a player, you could play sophomore, your freshman, or, or maybe even middle school years. Some people has had that pleasure, that opportunity to play at that young of an age. So ninth grade, I was playing at varsity level at times, and then junior varsity. So I was playing with 10th graders and and um, 11th graders. So that was still a pretty big accomplishment on my end at the time being, even though I still wanted more to, for example, play varsity all games and play in every game. It just didn't you know, necessarily work out like that. But I was still able to continue to get better um, and develop and learn more about the game. And then eventually from freshman year to sophomore year, it was a big difference in my game and the minutes I was playing with varsity. So in high school, you moved from Alabama to Florida. Yeah. And at that age, you're, you're still pretty young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, moving to a whole different state where, where people are different, where the culture is also different. Um, how was that for you to go there 
adjust to you know the situation and ultimately also why did you go there? Um, I like to say that the hardest challenge of my life is becoming a father. But before that, it was making that move to Florida because uh, rewind back, as I said before, I'm from Alabama. So for those of you that don't understand, most of the time guys are from Alabama are being overlooked. We have quite a few guys that's playing professional basketball at a high level internationally in the NBA, G League or whatever. Um, but it's not so many that come from where I come from. I'm literally a one percenter that comes from a, such a small town to be in this type of environment or whatever. Why, why is that? Um, because again, it's a population of 33,000 people. Um, outside of myself, it's only a select amount of people that's been at a higher level in college and a very, and just a small amount that's made it to the professional level, whether that be NBA, NFL, playing basketball internationally or playing whatever internationally. It's a very small um, percentage or whatever. So, so that's so exactly that's why, why. So, you know, the whole structure and you yeah, know, yeah, the yeah. coaching staff yeah, yeah, yeah. and everything is yeah, different yeah, yeah. to these bigger states, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's not only just players, it's even coaches. So if it's coaches that's played at, at mediocre levels, meaning not so good levels, then there's only so much they can teach you and so much experience they can, they can, they can um, provide for you because they haven't even made it to that level. So um, I'm coming from Alabama and it was, again, the hardest transition because I'm coming from um, a very big environment, a very toxic environment, a very um, not so positive environment, depending on wherever we go with that. Um, and then I go out here by myself. I leave my family, I leave my friends, everything I know and love, I leave behind to better, to better the chances of my, uh, better the chances of going to college because the reason of me going to Florida was to better my chances of getting into college because me and my family talked about it for weeks um, once we finished my junior season, going into Which the senior like season. Which is to explain it because it's, it's different over here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. freshman is the first year in high school. Yeah, correct. Which is seven, seventh grade? No. No, no, that's ninth grade. Ninth, ninth, ninth grade, grade is freshman so, year. So then the second grade. year is yeah, yeah, sophomore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have junior is just third year and then yeah, your yeah. last year is correct, correct, senior. Correct. Yeah, we was just we was wanting to go and explore and, you know, try and take a chance on myself, basically, and try and go and um, pursue other opportunities. So um, long story short, uh, I ended up getting recruited by this coach that was at Middle Tennessee State, but ended up basically getting fired and going to South Alabama. So he recruited me very hard, very hard from the moment um, of my 11th grade year. And he basically put in my soon to be head coach of the school down in Florida, Osmar Christian is the name of it, ended up um, basically just putting me on his radar, telling me about him and telling, telling him um, how big of an opportunity this would be for me in my career and of course the, the, um, the school. And um, so we, me and the coach, Jordan Ferris, his name, we ended up having a conversation as well as him and my parents. We had a conversation and we all seemed to um, like the the chances of this opportunity, basically. And um, I would say a couple of weeks after that, I ended up like packing everything up. We agreed on it and I transitioned down there. And basically from there, I was obviously going into my senior year of college, but I mean, high school, I'm sorry, but it was all, it was like me preparing for freshman year of college. I'm up and packing, I'm leaving everything and I'm taking whatever I could. I couldn't take everything with me basically. Um, and then I'm just going to go and figure it out as a, 17, 18 year old at the time, and I'm just going to figure it out basically. So how was Florida to you? I mean, moving to, to another state, you know, being on your own for the first time and then, but still go to school, have that program that you gotta do. For me, it was like my welcome moment to manhood because nobody in my hometown has did nothing like this, you know, for the, as far as I knew anyway to go and up and leave everything just like that, just to go and figure it out in another city and state was just like everything for me. So it was like a welcome into manhood. And I told you before that I had the uh, first couple of weeks I was homesick because I go from being around on a regular basis in school, I'm, I'm possibly possible to see 800 to 1,000 people in school, like just different classmates, teachers and all of that. And then I go to this very small hole in the wall school and I'm like, bro, is this even a school? What is going on? Seriously. And um, it was it. So I think total, total maybe about 70 people, 70 kids, totally. In all grades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe a bit more, 70 to 100 people, basically, something like that. And just for example, 
my the the year I graduated, um, it was me and like 22 other people that graduated. So imagine going from fast forward if I was to graduate my senior year in Gaston City, which is the high school I was at in my hometown. Mm -hmm. If I was to graduate from there, it would have been graduating with me and 400, 500, maybe 600 other people into this increment of people. So it was very different. Um, but as I said, it was my welcome to manhood because I had to, I had to adapt. Like my mom still had the message saved to my phone actually. Like I made it too far. I've been through too much. I put my family through too much to um, get to that situation and fold and, and quit. So it took a couple of more days basically of not being myself, maybe crying a little bit because it's just unfamiliar for me. It's like almost a foreign land. Even though it was a beautiful place, it was still a foreign land to me, you know. Yeah, it can be intimidating to be there, yeah, you know, yeah, at yeah. that age. Yeah, and then own. also, um, it's not like I'm just going to live and I have my own apartment, own room. I go and move into what I thought was Tampa. The school was like right at the border of Tampa, but where I was living is called Newport Ritchie. It's just not the most um, impressive pay place you would want to go. Like I go there and it's just, uh, it's a three bedroom house. Each room has two beds, two small beds, and, um, and then it's the coach's room. So it was me, started out with me and a few other guys, and as well as the coach, his girlfriend, and a dog. And then it ended up picking up two more guys. So we like six, seven people in the house, three bedroom house. So I was like, yo, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. But was there ever you know, a moment where you, you thought like, I just moved here, but I want to really go. I mean, homesick is, you know, one thing, but did you really thought about just going back home to Alabama because it was too much for you? Man, listen, um, I grew up never having my own room. So I'm thinking I'm, not, I'm about to at least go and have my own room. And then I get here with all this. I'm like, I'd rather go back and fight with my brother every day, you know, for having a bigger side of the room or having a bigger dresser. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was a biggest big challenge, like I say. Um, but mostly, I would say like those first two weeks, just having to adapt to that, just the new set of rules, just a completely new environment, not knowing anybody there, you know. And it's just that 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 feel of, hey, I can't really just go back home. Like it's not like not even like a a AAU trip that I'm not having fun with, and I could just easily get taken back home. Like I'm hours away, so I got to try and figure it out, basically. So you just mentioned AAU. Um, I mean, you stayed there in Florida, you, you played there, you go to school there, but um, AAU is kind of special for most players because this is your first like look at, I don't know, maybe semi-pro level because that's really important for young players to showcase themselves. Yeah, very So important. which role did AAU play for you? A, you played a massive part for me because, again, I come from the, that school system where the coach wasn't really getting nobody into college. If he was getting guys into colleges, local colleges in our city, that you wouldn't even have to, with the type of talent that we was having, you wouldn't even have to finish playing high school. And those, and those schools would be there to recruit you because it's like smaller schools, two-year schools. Um, so we just had to figure it out from there, basically. Ah. Um, That was a very tough situation, really. Very tough. But yeah, yeah, AU, again, it played a massive part for me because me being one of the better guys in the city, pretty much growing up from elementary on up, I was one of the growing to be tall, one of the tallest guys. And then I just had that passion to, and that drive to want to get better and continue to develop my game, basically as a young age, it leading up to um, high school. So AU, I was able to go from playing locally, playing everywhere locally around my city, uh, and then go to AAU and then playing guys from South Carolina, Texas, California, and such and such. And it's just like, it was just very eye-opening because it's like, it's almost like the professional world at the kids level because you're able to go and train and, and just travel, train, work on your game, play the game, get the bond with other guys that's from different cities and different states. Like it was, again, like the professional world at the kid level, just without the the payments, but our payments instead was getting gear from from teams and all of that. I'm sure Wes no, understands what I'm saying. But yeah, so it was, um, it, it played a huge part of my career for sure. So you then um, uh, transitioned from high school to college, which is like a huge thing because that kind of also sets maybe the, you know, the outcome of what your later career or career options can be. 
So which college did you choose? Like, did you have many offers? Have you been like a player that, you know, many colleges wanted to have there? How, how was that? Um, yeah, so I, I was able to finish up my um, recruiting process pretty good. I wasn't like one of the most um, exciting or entertaining or one of the guys that every college coach wanted in the country, but I was able to finish up and have a nice recruiting class. Um, it came down to me um, taking an official visit. An official visit for you guys, for you guys that don't know, is like your actual visits that you are um, intending on really taking in and getting the insight of the university that you're going to explore, basically. And you would get up to like five, if I'm not mistaken. And I only took two. I took one to University of Alabama and the other to Murray State. Yeah, I took those visits and I went to Murray State first, which is in um, somewhere in Kentucky like in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky, basically. And the University of Alabama was my second. Um, I had uh, Murray State in Alabama because I feel that like I would um, fit in right away. Just guys that's looking for more so undersized guys, guys that kind of flies under the radar, guys that's not like heavily recruited. Um, some guys that can fit into um, a situation where they're looking to play up and down, get up and down defensive then offensive minded type of systems or whatever. I feel like that's the type of situation that would fit most with me. Um, so I took those two visits and once we got to the University of Alabama, like I pretty much was going to commit the first day because um, again, where I come from is such a small environment. We don't really get to see these opportunities. So um, my, my parents are able to sit down and explore this university and see people that they would never ever see or have the opportunity to sit down with in their life. Like these guys, these people may not know, but Nick Saban is one of the best football coaches of all time college wise. And they're able to sit down with him in his office and, you know, just have any conversation they would like with him basically. And so we was able to do that, explore the campus, explore and see um, the opportunities that comes with the situation, the benefits that comes with it. And it was just a hands down situation. Like I was going to get well taken care of before signing there. So it was easy. And then it was in the state of Alabama, of course. And then it's two hours, not even two hours from my hometown. So it was an easy decision for me to make. So was it at the end a good decision for you? Like going there, how was your transition? Did you adjust well to, to college? Um, how? How would you describe that? I definitely think it was a good decision. I can't, um, obviously we can't go back and turn any decision we've made. Um, so I'm completely happy with the decision I made. I feel that it was a very good decision. It was a decision that helped uh, mold me into the man that I've become today as well. Because in college, I, I expressed to you before, I was able to experience so many, so much adversity. Um, whether it's adversity I was just meant to go through or maybe I put myself through basically just by me being ignorant, not being knowledgeable enough about whatever, or um, me just, again, maybe just me meant to be in that situation. And um, college helped prepare me for where I'm at today as a man, as a father, as a professional athlete, all that adversity I went through just in year one, not even to mention year two, three, four, five. Yeah. Um, University of Alabama treated me very well, and it was a great experience. So you said um, that you in our preparation for the interview said that um, in college you kind of liked consistency yeah. and how to you know put in the work in a focused way. So again, I, I have to continue to say this, that I come from where I come from. So I'm doing this every day. I'm playing basketball every day. I'm not, you, I'm pretty much not for, forced to work on really developing my game. I'm working on developing my game myself more so up until I got to um, my senior year of high school where I was consistently getting development and proper development in my game from ball handling and shooting, just learning the game. Like it wasn't up until that point. So I come from, basically we was almost doing whatever we want to do on the court. We still had a coach, a respectable guy. He was like a pastor, but it wasn't like, it wasn't much development. So I come from all of that, being able to, and kind of being one of the best players that I can get away with almost whatever. Having, um, arguments with the coach at times or whatever, just me being a hothead, me being passionate and not being able to control it. And it kind of still works in my favor that I can kind of do what I want. And then I get to this um, billion dollar organization, um, meaning the NCAA in college, it just doesn't work like that, you know? So 
some things that no matter who you are, you got to have to like get in line almost. You're going to have to adjust or you're going to find your way out of college basketball soon. So I had to figure it out. And um, just that, that, that um, having that everyday mentality of, man, we got to do this again. We got to do this again. Weights, track, um, running in the morning, practice in the evening, running in the morning, practice in the evening. Like it was just mind blowing to me. Like I was not exposed to nothing like that. You know, even though I was made for it, I was built for it, I still needed that challenge, you know. Yeah. And it would be days that you can tell my energy, my head is not there. And that's where I would struggle at specifically with the consistency. There every day that was what was kind of holding me back at that point. And as well as maybe some other things, again, just the lack of experience, the lack of guidance outside of basketball, like my coaches and all of that did a great job. But if I get back on the phone and talk to some of my family and friends, it's like more likely about them telling me all the things I want to hear or it's people that's telling me stuff that I probably don't need to hear because it's going to drive me in different directions, basically. So, What was um, the unlock for you that, because I remember that you said that there was like an event where you said, oh shit, I'm doing this wrong or there is room for improvement. So what was you know the, the event that changed your mind? It took it. T it really took one coach um, that I liked a lot, but I disliked so much because he really tell you what you need to hear, and he would hold me accountable. And I hated that so much. At the same time, yeah. I hated it seriously. So it would be days, and he wasn't even the coach that recruited me at the university. It was a different coach. So he would bring me in and sometimes sit me down and talk about film. I'm probably already tired from class or whatever. So he telling me little things about this on film, on video that I did wrong like yesterday, maybe two days ago. And I'm like, coach, that was yesterday, two days ago. But I wasn't understanding at the time of what he was trying to do at that moment and what he was building me for on going forward. You know what I'm saying? So it was, uh, it was just a lot of that, man. I had to try and figure it out basically. But that coach ended up being my coach um, at the next school at the Northern Kentucky University I told you about. And even from there, like, he stayed on me. He always made sure he kept me in line, basically, because he knew my mind could drift drift off in that moment or as soon as I get home. Like, I was a trustworthy guy, but you kind of had to call me sometimes late at night, like, where are you? What you up to? And he was that type of guy, you know what I'm saying? So him sp specifically, John Brandon, was the biggest factor for sure, of just keeping me on track and keeping me and holding me accountable, basically. You had to redshirt twice in college. Redshirt means for those who don't know, because I didn't know before. Also, the word is kind of weird. I don't know why they call it redshirt, to be honest, yeah. like a red T-shirt, or I don't really know where it comes from, but it means that you're sitting out, you have to go to, to class, right? And, and do your usual college. You know? So you basically, you basically do everything, basically do everything except travel with the team. Like you're not, I think you're not supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah, as far as like role games, But everything else you do, attend the practices, home games, you attend, sit on the bench. Um, yeah, you just don't play any games. The most important part, you know. Yeah, which is like you're, you're sitting out for two years in your case and you're, you're missing, you know, that development, that experience for, for two years. So first of all, why do you have to sit out for two years? Because usually, you know, you, you redshirt for one year and then you're eligible to play again. Why, why did you have two years? Well, so the first year was again my freshman year, so it was this. It was like this. It was a life of a roller coaster. One day I'm doing very well or pretty good, and then another day it's just like, where is he? You know, what has he got going on? So I was struggling with that up and down, up and down. From the moment I got there in the summer, it was um, up and down, like I say. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I more so needed that, needed the red shirt process, and. Um, It was just, I hate how they, how they brought it to my attention. It was the first um, practice game, preseason game. And um, they came to me as we was warming up before the game and like, hey, we're thinking of red shirt in you. So from there, my whole mentality changed because it's like, I feel, um, once again, I feel um, unappreciated. I feel like left out. I feel not valued. So my mind, like mindset flipped right away then at that moment because it's like, This is why I come here, of course, to get an education and all of that. But this is what I, I want to do after school. So 
So that kind of helped you to be more motivated also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And really... I felt more motivated and then I felt tarnished. So I was always in between. I told you before, I was always up and down. There's days I come in on the most enthused. I'm, I'm taking advantage of this off time and working on my game. And then there's days where they almost have to drag me in there because it's like I'm very upset with having to sit out and, and see my peers, see my guys that I've been in this battle with um, playing these games and you know, doing well or struggling without me, and then I can't, um, I can't help. So it was like driving me crazy, really. Um, but yeah, I had to sit out. I had to sit out and sit that time and figure it out, man, from, from the sidelines. You know, I had to learn and observe the environment, the business side of it. And, um, you know, it kind of self-evaluate as well to see what type of man I was and, you know, see what I was capable of. Because you can easily go from that and then go backwards and, you know, give it up or go to a smaller school right away or whatever. So it helped prepare me for where I'm at now. So then you redshirt for the second year. Yeah. Why is that? Because, um, so at the end of the freshman year, that was by, by then Coach Grant, like sixth or seventh year. And he had, um, throughout his time there, he did okay, not so well, did okay there. And it was just basically his time to get out of there as a coach, yeah. And it was basically just his time to almost get out of there. So he was like basically fired, but he just stepped down, resigned basically in a more, I guess, professional way, professional manner. And so um, with them, with the process of about to bring in a new coach and then bring in a new coach, the new coach pretty much knows guys that he has a, that he has a liking in and guys that he may be un, unaware of or unsure about. And uh, it was just one of those situations where obviously I didn't play. Um, he probably didn't know much about me and wanted to go another direction, basically. So we just basically agreed to part ways, basically. And um, from there, not long after, the guy I was just speaking of, John Brandon, um, ended up becoming the head coach of Northern Kentucky University. And um, he called me pretty much right away, wanting to, um, me to check out the university and um, possibly sign there. So I did some research, took some time, and then um, I ended up signing there maybe sometime like late July. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm sorry, late June. So I ended up signing there. And um, since I was a transfer from another Division I, um, I had to sit out again right away. Um, yeah. yeah, so that it took another year off of my, my college career right there. So two years back to back. So how did you feel about it knowing that you actually want to become a pro later on? But you're sitting out, you're missing this valuable experiences and you're playing against other guys and learning that. Um, how did you deal with that? And then how did you transition into your actual college years playing? Um, man, I felt very let down, even though I was going into the situation knowing my coach was trying to get it approved because I was also, um, while I was at sitting out in University of Alabama, I had a fractured foot. So I was, I had to sit out regardless at that point the whole year because I had a fracture in my left foot. Um, so my coach was hoping to try and get it flagged by the NCAA, but it wasn't able to, it wasn't able to get it overturned. So I had to sit the, sit the second year out, but I was still able to, I mean, unable to, uh, unable to play, I'm sorry. So it just, again, I felt let down, I felt, um, like not only for myself, but for my family, you know, because we all have big expectations of me just coming in and having much success after having such a great senior year of high school and all of that. And, and um, again, having to sit out at Bama, it just kind of um, turned the tables for me a bit. It made me refocus even more. It made me um, evaluate even more because now I've went, moved back further from my hometown um, which was about seven hours away in Kentucky, closer to Ohio, basically. So again, I had to just reevaluate, try and um, see if this really for me, if this is what I really want, you know, and I had to stick with it, basically. So how was your college experience at that point? Still just practicing every day, you know, doing all the workouts and all of that, but I couldn't play any games. So it was just a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of extra workouts. When, when it was times where the team was about to go on the road, I would have more workouts basically before they leave. And then I would probably have a workout the next day. So probably on a game day with one of the like assistant coaches or managers, work out with them. And then I would just still have my normal schedule and go to class or now I'll probably have a, a little more free time to go and hang out. So I, I was able to then kind of have a more balanced life. So then I was able to kind of find more, a couple of more friends outside of basketball 
um, around the campus and go and hang out with those guys on campus, you know, get food or go and hang out somewhere close by. Uh, the College of Kentucky, they played in D1, right? Yeah, yeah. And what you did in your senior year, right, is go from a D1 college to a D4 college. Um, which not, D, not D4, um, NAIA. Oh. Yeah, yeah. You mean in the, the senior year of college? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 it was an NAIA. So it's like Division I, Division II, Division Three, and then NAIA, yeah. and then junior college. Which initially sounds like a real step back. You're coming from, you know, a D1 college, which is like the highest division in NCAA, and then you're going down to, you know, one of the lowest, quote unquote, divisions there. Why did you do that? And, you know, how did you then cope with that? Um, well, I wasn't like forced out or kicked out of the university. Like it was just like pretty much anywhere else for me. Like I was um, embraced by pretty much everybody there in the organization, guys that I was on the team with. It was just a me decision. You know, I had sacrificed so much with missing my first two years of college, um, having much success um, as a team and probably as well as for myself, not maybe not up to my likings exact, but I was able to achieve um, success also in the, on the court and off the court there at, at um, Northern, Kentucky, Northern Kentucky at the time. But um, I just feel that I was capable of much more and I feel that the, role that's, the roles that I was taking um, the past couple of years in Northern Kentucky that I'm, I'm much better than that basically. I had to take a chance and bet on myself basically. So after my, um, after my fourth, my, I'm sorry, my third year at Northern Kentucky, once we finished the season, I had went and talked with the coach and told him, and I didn't even talk to my parents about this, but I was quite sure that I was gonna make a move and try and go somewhere else. And it kind of hurt me in, in uh, so many ways because I wasn't a graduate transfer, meaning uh, my senior year, I didn't graduate from college. So I did an extended year. And without me graduating, I had to go to a smaller level school mm -hmm. because um, again, I wasn't a graduate. So I couldn't go to another division one and I don't even think a Division II I could attend. So it had to be like NAI or the maybe Division Three, maybe. Um, so yeah, I took that I took the opportunity and bet on myself to, to show that I was capable of so much more. And I was just basically just screaming for help, screaming for um, some freedom. Cause I know the type of game style that I have, you gotta have trust, trust in me and, and my abilities to know that I can, um, do some special things on the court, not just for myself, but for my guys on, alongside me. And the role that I was taking there was keeping me very limited, you know, and I knew that I could do more. And it was and it was showing in the stats that when the moment, the minutes that I would play, whether it be in big minutes or small, I was very efficient and effective. So again, I was willing to take that chance and bet on myself to go to a smaller school for a bigger role, for a bigger purpose. So how, this, how did this work out for you? So I didn't care if it was in Alaska or in Europe, I was gonna take this opportunity and try and, you know, try and make it happen basically. And um, at the time, actually me and my dad wasn't really on the same page um, for, for whatever reason, I can't even really remember, but we wasn't on the same page, so we wasn't speaking. So he didn't find out to maybe like a week or a couple of weeks before I was leaving for the school to know that I was going to another school. Yeah. And um, they was kind of upset about that because it's like you leaving Division One, you're going to a third school, like that's kind of risky. It doesn't look bad. Coach Brandon, it was still it was taking care of you, but they know I wasn't happy there. And my happiness, I feel like anybody's happiness should matter more than, than whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, at, at least to a certain extent. So did it work out for you? Yeah, it worked out. So um, we was able to win a lot of games, make the playoffs and all of that. And um, I, I, I can't say as a leader of that team or captain of that team, I did the best I could to get us um, as far as possible. And we ended up losing in the Elite Eight in the playoffs. So I'm not satisfied with that still to this day, but I am happy to say that I took on a leadership role, pursued it and embraced it and, and I did well at it. But individually, I ended up winning the national player of the year. So that's a very big, big, big bonus. I won player of the year in the league, defensive player of the year, newcomer of the year. Uh, statistically, it's only three players in the state of Louisiana State University, LSU history, that's won national player of the year. And that's Shaquille O'Neal, Pete Maverick, and myself. So that's, a, that's some nice company to sit alongside, you know? Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was some fun. Right. Yeah.
as well as as well as um, small college player of the year, um, like the highest rebound average in over like 15 years there in um, in the in the I like as a whole. So I was able to go there and do some special things and get my point across that again that I was capable of so much more than what people was giving me basically. So you kind of made that um, you know looking forward to a professional career, knowing that you know this step back will eventually help you, you know, getting a real pro contract at some point. And um, I mean, it kind of worked out at the end, but how was the transition from being in college, going pro, having an agent, you know, where do I, in which country do you play, which league, how did this work? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say kind of, it definitely worked out, man, because um, I was in Luxembourg, I, um, so my first pro contract was in Luxembourg. Um, so before getting to that moment, um, I finished again having a great year in my senior year in college. So mentally, I'm thinking I'm going to the NBA. But realistically, I'm knowing like I'm hoping to at least get like um, maybe an NBA tryout workout or like um, G League, the development league, maybe get some workouts there, whatever. But um, just the way I was playing, I was feeling like, man, I can go big right here. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, I was like hyped about that, but I was working with this one guy who's supposedly a big time agent. And uh, well, we wasn't signed together, but he was basically seeing what he could bring to the table for me. And so- Advising you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this was finishing up senior year of college. So at this point I'm finishing up with the school work. So it's just literally just working out now, hanging out. And I stayed around the school for a bit just to see what he can do for me. And I'll have my own apartment there um, and I could just keep working out and stay in the, in the environment that I've been in and just had success in rather than going back home so soon. So I stayed there for a couple of months and then um, it's just, we would talk like every week or week or two and he would just feel me in like, hey, I'm thinking I can get you a workout here with the Dallas Mavericks G League team or the Houston Rockets G League team. I'm like, okay, hey, you got my number, just let me know where to go and I'll try and go from there basically. And um, it was none of that, like I, he didn't. Um, never happened. Yeah, it never happened. So I ended up going back home, you know, working out, spending time with family, my girl. And then um, this was about September and I ended up signing with this agent that my former coach, um, John Brandon in Northern Kentucky was, um, it was his agent while he was a professional many years ago. And once before, it was a really big time agent in Europe. So I'm like, yeah, okay, let's go with it. And um, so I signed with those guys that was basically based out of Luxembourg. So they got me the deal in Luxembourg with the Musil Pikes in like two days, basically. Um, so I signed there. And then um, I would say another two or three days from there, I was headed out to Luxembourg. And uh, Luxembourg was a great experience for me, man. I, as, I, as I continuously say that I come from where I come from. So many people are not exposed. No people can even, don't even know where Luxembourg is. Most people where I'm from don't even know where Europe is. They just know Europe. Yeah. Honestly, I'm, I'm being honest. Yeah, like nah, I'm being honest. So honest. Like a lot of people in the States don't yeah, know yeah. anything about the state, uh, yeah. outside of the States. I tell so. people like, where are you? I'm like, I'm in Germany right now. Were well, you next to Russia? I'm like, no, I'm not near Russia. No, do you know where that is? <laughs> Seriously though. Uh, so yeah, Luxembourg was very nice for me. I was able to meet some very nice people there, some good guys, a very professional organization similar to here in Chemnitz. Um, they took care of me very well. At the time my daughter wasn't born, my girl was at home pregnant with my daughter, so they wasn't there. But I know they would have treated, treated them there, treated her there um, very well also. So man, I have no complaints. It was, it was all good out there. But how did you go into Luxembourg knowing that, you know, Luxembourg's not one of the highest leagues in Europe? Yeah, not, you know, that's, that's kind of also sounds like you, you took the step um, back from the one college to the NIL and then going to Luxembourg first, which is not like the highest. I mean, you ended up in higher leagues, which is, which is great and um, um, it's good for you. But how did you approach that? For me, man, it's a, it was an opportunity and um, the opportunity was um, extremely big, man. People was willing to take a chance on me because they didn't have to do that. You know, it's a thousand, millions of other players all over the world they could have found. And they allowed me to come and represent their organization. So for me, it was an opportunity. It didn't matter if it was um, in Luxembourg or Germany or wherever. I'm going to take it seriously and I'm going to um, be a true professional every day 
So for me, it was um, an embracing moment. Like I took it again, very seriously. It was me and one other professional. Everybody else was semi-pro, so they was like working or at school. And um, I just took advantage of the situation, you know, and I was able to play, have much success there, build relationships from people that was from Luxembourg, some of my, a couple of my teammates. Actually, one of my teammates was one of my college teammates. So we had a great relationship and our birthday is on the same day. So yeah, <laughs> very weird, I know, yeah. but we but we end up becoming so close that to like now that's my brother, like really like my brother. Again, I had some great relationships there, so that situation was probably meant for me, and I love them, love all of those people still to this day. So what got us through you know, the journey from being in Luxembourg at the league, like what you described, to all of these other countries, and then how you end up in Chemnitz, because. Um, I remember that you said that you know each year or each season you kind of took a step forward in in the league or you know in the country respectively. So, can you guide us through these different experiences in different countries with different cultures and how you how you manage that? Yeah. So once I was able to get year one year one under my belt, now I got some experience. I've been talking to some guys and I'm like, I need to fire my agent because I can't I can't stay here in Luxembourg. Not to say that um um too good or anything, but I know I'm, I'm very capable of playing at a much higher level than this. So um, so I ended up firing my agent, and he was very understanding of it. Um, of course, let down and upset because... But why Why did he understand it? Because I remember, I for, I'm actually, you, you said that he was just a part-time agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot yeah. what he actually did. Yeah, and that was concerning for me. So when I, um, and I didn't know that, I thought he was a full-time agent. So I started having knee pain around, this was before COVID started. This was like in um, early April. I started having pain in my left knee. So um, the organization took me and went to the hospital and I would get like shots in the knee on my off days. And so I go there and I see him one day standing above me about to give me a shot. And I'm like, yo, what's going on here, bro? I thought you was, I didn't know that he was like part-time nurse. I was, again, I thought he was my four, a full-time agent. So I, I couldn't, it, it was like, at that moment, I knew I was gonna fire him at the end of the season, basically. I just had to, I just had to finish out. Which is no disrespect, but yeah, no, if you have a full-time agent, like he has yeah, yeah. other connections, yeah. you know, a, a different network, which can lead you to yeah. other places, so. I hope, I hope nobody takes that as I, I was disrespecting him or nothing like that. Um, but again, I just want it better for myself and I want someone that's gonna be full-time representing me and doing what they are gonna do because I'm gonna do what I have to do no, no matter the situation I'm in. And so um, that was just my purpose of doing that. You know, um, from there, I was able to sign with a different agency, um, Intersport at the time, once I um, fired my um, Luxembourgish agent. And um, from there, I transitioned and went to Finland and now I was able to, like, I, as I said, have much success there um, being able to adapt, build relationships with people from different places that I haven't been or um, guys that I haven't known, uh, met before. So it was a very nice situation as well. Probably, not definitely not probably, the coldest place I've ever been in my life, the coldest. But again, it's just a part of any other milestone in my life, any obstacle in my life. I was able to um, embrace it head on and, and achieve so much success from going there. Yeah, so after Finland, you ended up in Ukraine. Um, just take us briefly through your, your exp Ukraine experience. But that Ukraine experience was very different because I was still signed with the agent from Intersport. And um, I'm going off of everything he's saying, you know, trying to put it into my mind while um, taking in this process of possibly signing with these guys. I honestly didn't know much about Ukraine, but besides a little bit of history that's went on, uh, went on with them in Russia or whatever. Besides that, I didn't know too much. I knew basketball-wise, the league was was okay there, was pretty good there, not the not the best or whatever. Um, I heard a bit about some of the organizations, um, about money issues and all of that. But that Ukraine situation was very eye-opening for me, especially once it, um, to fast forward a little, once it came down to hearing things about the war, about it possibly being a war, and we come from America, um, to where it's, we have a, a lot of uh, issues that's going on that's going on there to this day and uh, history, of course. But we never, me and people in our time, never he heard anything like this or seen anything like this. So um, I was, um, with me being me, just being 
um, willing to be understanding and not be so quick to judge or not be so quick to leave this situation because I still have my career I got to think about. And I don't want these people to possibly tarnish me or my family or my name because me wanting to just flee and get the safety, you know, because and this is serious talks that we was hearing about, you know, was talking about war. Um, so again, it was very eye-opening, able to be there and encounter with so many different people, so many different places all throughout Ukraine, especially in Kiev, which is where I was living and playing. And um, able to build relationships with specifically some of the Ukrainian guys, guys that I really was fond of, guys I, had, I still to this day have good relationship with. A couple of guys or a few of the guys as far as Ukrainians I still talk with consistently to this day. And it's good relationships. Those are good people to me. Those are friends or family like to me. So it was eye opening to see that, you know, these people come from here. They see this every day. This is normal. This is life. And then another day is not there no more. Possibly, you know, yeah. uh, a family member or a favorite place that you would like to go to is not is maybe not there or not the same anymore. Um, um, I've heard a, a lot about a lot of the crazy things that's happened during this war, and I would hate to see or for anybody to experience something like that. So again, it was very humbling for me to be able to live where I live, go through, go, go to the places that I go to. And, um, and also where, where I've been, where I grew up at, that's a big blessing right there. So it was very humbling. And so then moving on to um, Lithuania, which was kind of then your breakout year internationally, if you want to take it like that, um, just Move us, you know, tell us about your experience there. Tell us about what you've uh, done there. So this was one of those situations where it was new because this is a much respected league, a, a more respected league than some of the places I played in. Well, all of them pretty much. Yeah. Um, but it was a situation where my coach didn't speak the best English. So this was um, um, the language barrier was, uh, was an issue at times. Um, especially coming in right away, like I really didn't understand anything he was saying pretty much besides like bits and pieces. So a lot of the times I'm having to always get a, get a second opinion or get feedback from a local, a Lithuanian or um, someone that, that's been there for a little longer so they may understand them. And um, for a bit it was a, again, it's kind of holding me back a little because I might not know exactly what he was saying and it might've cost us this possession right here or whatever. Um, but once I was able to get a feel and a little better understanding of what he was saying, like we was very cool and they was, um, very embracing on my end, especially after playing game one and seeing what I can bring to the table for the city of Yonville, for the organization. Like I was embraced there right away from the, from the guys I was playing alongside to the organization to a lot of the fans, which I hate to call, um, um, call the fans. I, I prefer to call them supporters because I'm, I'm for me personally, I'm no one special to be a fan of. You know, you can support me and like to cheer for me, but I don't want you to be a fan or, you know, But um, yeah, that, that situation in Lithuania was very humbling, been very exciting. Um, that's probably one of the more situations I've been um, intimately embraced, like, you know, close to close contact, also. yeah. On the court, off the court, like I will always have encounters with people who are close by in my city, outside of my city, and they would, you know, know who I am and um, show me that love and uh, appreciation. And that's the type of stuff that I love, you know, with just, It goes a long way for me. So it was a different type of embracement out there in Lithuania. Still to this day, I get text calls. My mom, my girl gets friend requests from people from Lithuania, from Yonova, yeah. So it just shows that the, the, what I bring to the table, you know, it, it rubs off and it can kind of be contagious to other people. So how did you then, you know, from being in Lithuania, playing good there, end up here in Chemnitz? I said, God, God stirred me here in this direction. You know, I didn't... Um, I didn't know too much about the city of Chemnitz too much. I heard about the team and you know the the potential that the team, the organization has, but I didn't know too much about the city of Chemnitz. So um, once it came to my radar, once I talked with coach and once I was speaking with my agent and then I would like to say my assistant agent, my girlfriend started to do research on TikTok and all of this, you know, hey, Chemnitz is, is a cool place. I'm like, really? Where you find this at? TikTok? I'm like, oh, okay. But yeah, so we, we started to do um, started to do our research and gain a little more information on um, on the city of Chemnitz, the organization, and all of that. And um, 
it pretty much came clear as day once talking with coaches. I told you before that I feel like this is the right situation for me. And it was still early in the summer in my recruiting process. So who knows who would have come to the table with what type of money or whatever. But this situation, it felt right and it still feels right. But what makes you say this? I mean, for all of us, we've barely been in situations where a coach once, you know, having us play for a team and, you know, we don't know these situations, these usual conversations, like even some guys said that um, some coaches don't even talk to the players until they show up for the first day of practice in preseason, right? That's, I think, even more commonly. Or you just have like a phone call, like a couple of minutes. So what he does is kind of different. And, you know, talking about this, like, why did you then, you know, decide or make a decision so quickly. Mm. Well, I was also one of those ones that mentioned that also. So um, out of the, this, this was, this is year five. So out of the past four years, going into each situation, I only talked to the coach out of Luxembourg and the coach out of Finland. Mm -hmm. The other two situations, I was just going in blindly, like not necessarily knowing what system we was going to operate in, uh, kind of, sort of, but I was going in blindly completely and going into Ukraine and uh, going into the Lithuania situation. I'm just going off of the information where my agents are providing, you know, and then the research that I am doing or some guys that I know might have um, played against this team or know somebody that played there. And then I, you know, kind of contact them or they contact me or whatever. So it was, um, it was different talking with Coach. Um, we were first, I'm sure Wes can vouch, uh, the phone call was almost two hours. I'm just getting back into the country from Lithuania because I had a, like a war ceremony I had to attend once we finished the playoffs. And um, at the time, my girl was like, yo, you just got home two or three days ago, literally, into America. Um, and we was already on the phone talking about this previous season, expectations of next season, um, you know, and so on and so on. And, um, you know, I, I would say literally middle of the interview, I kind of had that feel that, you know, this is different. You know, he has a he has a completely different approach to unlike most professional coaches. He's embracing. And that's what I love right away. Uh, I mentioned to you also when I see coach, if I close my eyes, I see him with a straw hat, with a tractor, with overalls. And he's about to put in work. That's and that's what I love, though, because, you know, this is what he's going to bring to your organization. This is what he's going to bring to the team. And that's the type of guy I need to hold me accountable every day, you know, and as well as have an understanding of me and my game style and what I can bring to the table. So it was, it was uh, very easy. Um, besides the timetable, you know, I would like to take a little more time to make my decisions. But besides that, it was easy to make my decision here by far. So how was your first Chemnitz experience? Um, it was very good, man. Very good. I, I like the city of Chemnitz. I was surprised to see that it was so big. I was seeing coming in, it was like a total of population amount, maybe like 250,000 people, something like that. So I was impressed to see that because I've been in very smaller cities. Well, maybe besides Kiev, definitely besides Kiev. Every, everywhere else has been like very small villages almost. Um, so it was shocking to see that I was like back in a big city like environment. Um, where everything wasn't so close by as far as practice facilities and game and all of that. So it took a bit to adjust to that, you know, and have to have it to um, adjust my usual routine, whether that's going to practice or games, because now the drive is a little further. You guys done so much construction here, I don't understand. <laughs> but so literally, it took me until the first like three months to, to try and figure it out. So it's like, okay, now I can lead the GPS along. So that was throwing me off a little bit. You know, I'm paranoid when I wake up, like I got to leave a little early because you know it's construction here, here, and here. Yeah, so I had to, once I got past that, was able to adjust and adapt to that. It was, it was fine, really. Like Kimness has been good, embracing uh, the organization, very professional. Like if, um, if I was to go on and play somewhere after this, I, it'd be very hard because again, everything that we need, and not only just myself, my family, like, man, I can't complain, really. Really. Would you say that, um, you know, being at this team right now, which has, I think, kind of good chemistry between all the guys, has this been the case for previous, you know, teams also? And if so or not, 
you know, how would you describe the difference in, you know, being close, everybody, you know, together, yeah. instead of, you know, just playing for the team and be there and do your job? I've been, I've had the pleasure of my whole professional career to be on teams that we had some good guys. So it, I haven't had many altercations or, mm -hmm. uh, guys that I played with in the past few years and like, I don't, I don't like that guy at all, you know, or something like that. It, maybe even vice versa. Um, but this situation is very different. I'm not saying this because I'm in it now, but because of, we got a, a, a group of guys that's very mature, that's seasoned, that's, um, that has some experience with playing at this level or maybe even a higher level. We got guys that's hungry, that wants to get better, that want to um, become better men, become better professionals, that want to be better at providing for themselves and bringing um, whatever they can to the team. And this plays a, a massive part. And it, you know, it's obviously showing right now. Of course, we got some good players, we got good coaching, but we got guys that's willing to lay their life down for the next person, for the next guy alongside of them. So I think that speaks to, speaks volumes, really. So would you say that, you know, I mean, you're here for a couple of months now. Would you say that you as a person, but also as a player really took a step forward just, you know, being here, being in the situation where a lot of people say that it's really, really good when it comes to the practice facility, to coaching, you know, all that stuff. Would you say that you already feel like you mature and you're, you're getting better? Yeah, yeah, I would say that hands down. I'm definitely, I'm, I, I can see um, a, a big step in myself, and I'm speaking on the basketball side right now, um, of the growth that I've taken, um, the, the information I've been able to intake from some of these different guys, the coaches, I've been able to get better, no doubt. So I'm very satisfied with that, but not comfortable because I want to continue to get better and show these guys that I have more in the tank and I have more to give to them. Um, but I would say personally, um, I've matured a whole lot because I am, I know for sure that my family would be here the whole time or at least most of the time. Um, but I'm able to be alongside guys like Wes Van Beck. I'm able to be alongside guys like Dre, guys that's very, that's true professionals. And I'm a true professional, but that's a true professional. So I'm able to, and I think I'm a little older than Wes, but in ways I look up to Wes, I like, the, I like how he carries himself as a professional first, how he carries himself as a man. Like that's huge for me. And I'm not saying it cause he's here. Like that's my guy right there. I really watch him put that work in. Seriously, seriously. Um, Dre, and if y'all don't know Dre, Dre talks all day, so you have no choice. You have no choice but to listen to Dre. But nah, I love Dre as well. I'm able to get so much game from him. And um, of course, on the court, but it's a lot of game from Dre um, off the court. It's so much game about, about relationships, about marriage, um, business, investing. It's sometimes I'm like, Dre, I don't even know how to respond to this, Dre, but... <laughs> I'm, I'm locked in, I'm engaged still, but you know, it's just, Dre's a very intelligent guy though, so I like, I like, um, I like being around him. Again, Wes, along with everybody else, I'm able to learn something from some of everybody, and that's the type of guys I love to be around. Maybe to finish this off, first of all, could you maybe describe also, you know, playing here, comparing it to the previous situations when it comes to the arena, because everybody is so proud of that, like, most people said, or most players actually said that the first thing they've heard from, you know, other players when they ask them about, you know, should I go to Chemnitz? It's like, you know, the atmosphere is crazy. And um, would you maybe share your experience with us? I was able to hear a lot of good feedback from the fans here in Chemnitz from um, a couple of guys I talked to that played here maybe last year or before. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, regardless of what these people may say, it's like it's still just noise in your ear until you go and see it yourself. And then um, I was able to get, again, to get embraced by um, a nice fan base out in, uh, or um, a nice amount of supporters there in, in, um, in Lithuania consistently. Like it was um, not a very big organization, or not one of the organizations with the biggest budget, but still a nice fan base. Um, and then I come here and then I see people here at the games, like, you know, almost two hours before the game, like, and these are some of the same people that's here every, every day before every game. It's like, you see the commitment, you see the loyalty, you see the, uh, the pride in the fight in the fans, you hear it all throughout the game. I have actually have some family coming out here and I think they would be completely overwhelmed with the fan base and, and how cheerful they can be 
possession, every possession by possession, you know, because where we come from, you have some crazy fan base and then you have some that's just, you know, clapping. It's it's a completely different environment here. So yeah, I think it'll be overwhelming, probably scary for some of our family that's gonna come out here. But yeah, it's been amazing. For me, um again, it's 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 been amazing because it's only it's only so much you know and so much you can see until you see it or until you and take in that environment. And then I'm coming here. Um, um, so I had the opportunity to play FIBA Euro Cup before against um, um, the Marlins, the Quirrell Yeah. That's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, yeah. Cross Home, yeah. And um, I was able to experience the BBL-like environment, like, man, that's cool, I like that. You know, um, but again, this here is, is very different, very thrilling, very exciting. Like, I look forward to playing the home game, so I know the fan base is unreal here, so. It, it, it gives us, uh, whether they know it or not, it gives the players an extra boost, you know, at times, whether we're playing good or bad. It's always good when your fans are bought in and they're, you know, um, fighting for their guys because we need that. Everybody, I think, can be happy about this because it shows the, I mean, there's, you know, there's the organization and they, they do a tremendous job, but there's also like, you can't have the best organization in the world, but if nobody cares about it, Exactly, exactly. You can have all the money, all the, you know, whatever, but the, the fans really play a massive part. And again, I hate to use that word, but um, they play a massive part because they pay their hard-earned money to come in and watch us. So it's a big deal, very big deal, at least in my eyes. So to finish this off, is there anything you want to, you know, say to the people, to the fans who are watching this on YouTube, anything you want to um, say? So I'm not so active on social media. So specifically, I would like to say hello to my parents. Um, I know I say it's a lot of situations that I've been through that's helped bold me into the man that I've come to become today. But my parents are two individuals that I, I look up to, that I'm inspired by because they worked so hard for so long. They sacrificed so much for so long and I put them through um, so many hard times for so long. Um, so. All I want to do is make my parents proud at the end of the day, as well as my girlfriend, my daughter. So I want to give a shout out and, and send much love to my parents, my family and friends back home. I um, want to say thank you to my, my teammates I'm able to play alongside with every day. Um, them being willing to play alongside me, work with me, um, communicate with me. Like it's a truly a um, fulfilling thing for me because I'm a very, um, um, loving guy, I love to build relationships. I love to meet new people. So I truly am um, always embracing these new situations, these new encounters. So for me, it matters the most. Thank you for this organization that treat me um, as a man first off and not as a, as a professional. You know, I am a man, I'm a father before anything and these people, uh, these individuals treat me very well. They treat my family well. So I can um, thank those, thank them enough and last but not least, thank these um, again. Thank these beautiful people that came out and supported us tonight in this um, in this process. That come out and support us in the games, or whether they don't come to the games and watch from home. Thank all of you guys for supporting us. I know you guys may be from here or not from here, but thank you supporting some of us guys that's not from this time zone, that's not from this space, but you guys still cheer us on and support us like family. So thank all of you guys for everything. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> that was really nice. So I mean, I wanna I wanna finish off too. Um, so shout out to everybody who's came through. It's cold outside. It's it's snowy. Like you don't have to be here, but you chose to be with us and you know listen to what Chef is going to tell us, which is really really nice. And we really appreciate every one of you. Um, also, thank you to everybody who watched this on YouTube. Um, we have a lot of people actually watching it on YouTube, which is really awesome. We, we get so, many, uh, so much feedback on the videos, which is great, which means that we're doing a good job here. Um, also, shout out to the Atomino again for giving us the space. Um, so yeah, we, we really appreciate you, and we hope to see you on the next episode also. Yes, sir. Nice. <laughs>